So interesting question came in today on the podcast. And by the way, if you if you need to email me, email podcast at grangersmith.com. And we'll walk through whatever you got going on, whatever your question is, could be about work or love or church or faith or struggle or heartache or um, music. We haven't had a good music question in a long time, but whatever it might be, feel free. We just walk through this like people sitting in the cab of a truck and and walking through something. And I wanted to read this one. I think it's an interesting question. I think it's it's kind of worth digging into here. And um, the question comes from from Allie, Allie from Georgia. And, and Allie says, I know I should keep my focus on Jesus, but should I still seek truth in my curiosities? I know God doesn't want me to be ignorant. However, the internet is full of opinions and people claiming to know something that I don't, such as the earth is flat, Antarctica is there's a wall around it. Our government is a deep state, so I shouldn't vote. I'm 28 years old, and I'm feeling very dumb. <laughs> uh, is the answer to not buy into any of it? Or does knowing prepare me for the future? Thanks for all you do, and for others, and for God. Uh, Ali, that's crazy. I think it's a good question. <laughs> um and I don't think it's it's ever been asked in that way, in that in that form. And so that's why I think it's I think it's an interesting question to kind of start this podcast with. Um really, you're saying it, it's interesting. Your second sentence is interesting where you said, but should I seek, but I should I still seek truth in my curiosities? And you know. I think what what you're also asking at the same time by saying that is, are there other truths out there? Granger, is there one truth or are there many truths? I know I should keep my focus on Jesus, but I'm kind of wondering how many truths I should think about. And that kind of leads me to a discussion I was having on my radio show after midnight. And the the question was, is morality subjective or, or objective? And what I meant by that is, how do you know what's right or wrong? How do you know right from wrong? And it's it's deeper than sa- just saying, well, th- you're raised that way. You're raised as a kid to know right from wrong by whoever raised you. But that's an, that's easy to rebuke that because you could just say, well, how, who taught the people that taught you? Well, you say their parents. Well, th- who taught them? Where does it come from? Like, where, where's the source of morality, right from wrong? And is it subjective or objective? Like I said, and that means, is it your truth or my truth? Or is there, does everyone have an opinion about morality? Which is, I I think, Allie, you're mainly asking that. I don't think you're saying, how could I know if the earth is flat? I mean, you can get on an airplane, you know, like you, you can, you, there are some things you, you could know today does Antarctica have a wall around it? Um, do you really want to know that? Are, are you really interested in that question? I don't think so. I think you could you could find that out if you dedicated your life to discovering more about Antarctica. You could, you, but I don't think that's what you're asking. I think you're you're asking um, as you look at social media and you see everyone's got an opinion about something. You're you're kind of asking who who do I know how to trust. Who do I know who to trust and how to trust? And where does trust come from? And more importantly, I think your question is, what is truth? It's, it's crazy. Pontius Pilate asked Jesus that same question. What is truth? We don't know. And the way that that was written in the gospel, we don't know. Prob- we, we probably think most people would interpret that as Pilate's it's kind of saying that in a frivolous way, like, what is truth? I don't, could anyone know that? That's kind of the tone that it seems Pilate had. What is truth? He's not really asking like, what is truth? Tell me. You know, he's not, it's it's more of just a retortive, hey, here, I, I don't know what you're talking about. No one could know that. So let's dig into this. This is what I've been saying on my radio show. When it comes to morality, C.S. Lewis had something pretty interesting about this. And 
He was commissioned during World War II, C.S. Lewis, the author, Chronicles of Narnia, and many, many other books. He was commissioned in World War II in, in England to host a radio show. And so he, they wanted him to write a, a monologue. There would be multiple shows for multiple radio shows in England during World War II, during a time when people needed to know truth. They needed to know about morality, about right and wrong, where morality came from, is it subjective or objective? And it, they, they got C.S. Lewis to write about this, not, not saying it like I just said it, but instead going through the back door and just making people think, exploring this. And the reason this, this is going down like this is because you got to imagine, you, you got mamas in England that could not understand the atrocities that were happening in Germany in the Nazi regime. They couldn't understand that kind of evil that their sons were going in to fight against. I'm not, I'm not talking about German boys. I'm talking about the Nazi regime, the idea of the Nazi regime and what that was doing. People could not reconcile. And I can't either because I didn't live in that time. And no one listening can really either. It's very difficult to reconcile especially raising, raising a, a Christian boy and sending him into that kind of evil. And he, he leaves on the train with his uniform on and you're crying and you're saying goodbye as the train rolls away. And he's, he's going into the jaws of hell, the unthinkable horrors of, of World War II. And they knew a little bit about this because a lot of the husbands... And our grandfathers were in World War I, fighting a different kind of evil from the same enemy. And so in order to reconcile, how do I, how do I sleep at night knowing my boy is over there? I'm, now I'm questioning morality. I'm questioning humanity. I'm, I'm questioning evil and good, all of it together. They, they get C.S. Lewis. And he comes in and he, he comes at it a very different way. I promise, Allie. <laughs> I promise I'm getting to your question. Um, C.S. Lewis comes in, and he starts with human nature, and he calls it the law of nature, and he says something interesting. Somebody called, let me say it this way, someone called my radio show and said, Granger, I got an answer for you. I got an answer to where does right and wrong come from? How do you know what's right and what's wrong? I got an answer to how you know that, and it's because you, you'll react according to your fears, and that's the way we've evolved, he says. You do what inherently, you go against inherently what you fear. That's basically what he's saying. So if you trace that back far enough through human evolution, whatever we feared, whatever our ancestors feared, we built a system in avoiding that. So murder, we know murder is wrong, the caller says, because we've grown and we've evolved to be afraid of death, therefore afraid of someone that would lead someone to their death. Murder is wrong morally because we've learned to fear it. Basically, he said everything, that all morals could be taken from that. And it's really an evolutionary standpoint. And so C.S. Lewis kind of tackles that idea. And it's, isn't it crazy that all, the year, all these years have gone by and we're still dealing with this, these same kind of questions? So C.S. Lewis says, okay, you have, you have a fire. I'm, now I'm making this up. C.S. Lewis had a different scenario. I'm going to say an, the scenario that I said on the radio. Say there's a fire in a, an apartment complex. And you're walking by and you see this fire. So you rush in to see if you could help. And there are people, able-bodied people, and you're helping them. And you're, you're getting out. There's a mother and she's got a child, a baby, and you want to help them get them out. All of us would say that's morally right. You need to help. And the, the evolutionist, the, the, the guy that's very practical in this says, yes, there's something in you that driven by fear, ultimately, that says, I got to get this woman out and this baby out because this is how the human race survives. We have to do this. Otherwise, we all, 
we all die and the human race is no more. So instinctively through our evolution, we're going to, we're going to be, we're going to desire to help someone to pull them out of this fire. So you're helping out these able-bodied people. You, you got this woman and you got the child and you're, you're helping everyone out, right? Now there's a problem. This C.S. Lewis recognized this problem. This is what he's saying on the radio show, essentially. What happens then when in that fire you see the old man in the corner and he's in a wheelchair? This is the scenario I built on the radio. And say, say this old man, not only is he old and he's in a wheelchair and he's paralyzed, but he also has some kind of dementia. There's, off, there's obviously something wrong with him. He's, he can't think straight. He, to put it practically, he's just a drag on society. Now he, he ain't helping anybody. He's not helping the community. Uh, in fact, evolutionary, evolutionarily speaking, if he dies in that fire, we're actually better. We're better as a species because he's kind of a drag on the healthcare system. He's just kind of a waste of food that we're, you know, he's a waste of resources. We're, we're spending time and effort on this old man in a wheelchair who's got dementia. And we're, we're kind of wasting, when we need to be focused on the woman and the child and the, the able-bodied people to move on as a species. But that's not what happens, is it? C.S. Lewis recognizes this. And the listener of this podcast recognizes this, that when you see that old man, something in you goes against that evolutionary spirit and says, help this old man. I got to get this old man out of here. Hang on, sir. I'm going to help. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this. I'm going to get these boards pulled out of here. I'm going to hang on a second. I'm going to get this wheelchair up over this thing. I know you're stuck here, but I'm going to get you out. You hang on, sir. We're going to we're going to get this figured out. And you start helping the old man out of the burning fire. And that goes against it. That goes against everything that's practical, that says we evolved and we're driven by fear because you just went into the fire, which is fear-driven. And then you're doing something that's against everything that helps the species evolve. Animals don't do this. My chickens, when one of my chickens gets sick, they, they, the other ones peck her till she dies. Because it's survival of the fittest, and it's, you know, only the strong will survive, and, and they help their, their own little communities by just getting rid of the weak. It helps everything. Humans don't do this. There's, a nut, there's something else outside of us, outside of everything that's practical, and outside of everything that your brain says you should do. There's something else. There's a consciousness that says, help the old man. What is that? Where does that come from? That's what we need to know. Why, are, why do we have that in us to help that old man? Now, we can do a whole podcast about just that. What is that? But my point to Allie from Georgia is, there, that is that is enough evidence that there is a truth out there outside of ourselves, outside of our opinions, outside of our subjective, I, I like this, you like this. There's something else pulling at us from our gut, from a guttural instinct, from deep down in our heart, there's something else that says, save that old man. Get that old man. Why? That defies all odds. So you say, Allie, I know I should keep my focus on Jesus, but I'm going to stop you at the but. And said so to keep your focus on Jesus, you have to go to his word as he's revealed himself in the Bible. Jesus has revealed himself in one way, and that is through his revealed word. The book of John starts in the gospel. The book of John starts, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then you see in John 1.14, it says, and the word became flesh. Jesus is the word. He's revealed himself in the word, and the word became flesh. So, to know him, to keep your focus on him, would be to go back to his word. Or to be involved with the preaching of his word. To be in a faithful church that declares and preaches his word on Sundays. To be around other people who hear his word and, and, and talk about his word and wrestle with his word and pray his word. To be close to Jesus, to keep your focus on him, would be to keep your focus on his word. When you do that... And when you seek, instead, you, you seek the kingdom, 
as Jesus says in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. All these things will be added to you. So when you say your second sentence is, but should I still seek truth in my curiosities? I think your curiosities are fine. Your, your desires are fine. Seek the Lord first, delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You see, so if you're seeking Jesus through his revealed word, through his people in a church revolving around his word, that's really revolving around the preaching of his word, if you're, that, if you're seeking that, he will give you the desires of your heart. In fact, he will give you the delight in his word that then lead to the desires of your heart, which I think is the same thing you're asking when you say, my curiosities. So what I've kind of established here is that there is a truth outside of ourselves. There is something pulling us to save the old man on the fire. And recognizing that there is a truth outside of ourselves, we know that we need to keep our focus on Jesus, knowing that he is the source of, source of truth, capital T. And when we keep our focus on him, everything else just seems to work out. Either you're talking about our government is a deep state and should you vote or not? That leads right back to, to his word. How? Because you're in, a, you're in a church, you're in a local church, lowercase c, you're with people that you trust, that are focused on his word, just like you. You're doing it in community. And you go, what do we think about this government? What do, you, what do we think about this voting thing? And you wrestle with it, but you're wrestling with people and you're, you're having a discussion with people who are first focused on the kingdom of heaven. They're eternally minded people instead of temporally minded people. People that go, yeah, yeah, this could happen and this could happen really bad. But in the end, we know who the king is. We know who wins in the end. And so, yeah, maybe we should vote depending on these policies. And, and I agree with this policy. You agree with this policy. We disagree here. Assuming that morality is out of this because morality is, should be objective for a Christian. Uh, but it, you're wrestling with these things in a community with with the church and these other things like the the flat earth, the Antarctica wall, the the government, the deep state, state the, everything else you see on social media just starts to fade away in the background. It's just it just becomes white noise that you could slowly turn that volume down to nothing. Understand there is a capital T truth. It is objective. Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. Seek him. Seek the kingdom of heaven. The reign of Jesus in your heart, essentially, is what that means. And all these other things will be added to you. All the other things you need will be added to you. All your desires, your curiosities will bring him glory because you won't worry about other worldly, temporal things. Okay? If you want to get a hold of me, go to cameo.com slash Granger Smith, and I can send you a video message made right here on my phone, whatever you want me to say. Happy birthday, happy anniversary. It's a great way for you and I to stay in contact and to get someone a gift that might seem to have everything. Hey, get them a gift at cameo.com slash Granger Smith. Next question says, Granger, please keep me anonymous. I'm not sure if they are listening to your podcast. It says, hey, Granger, I recently lost a relationship with someone I truly love. Uh, the old me was the party type. I, found, I finally found a woman that I wanted to share the rest of my life with. Our relationship was great, but all this, all of a sudden it ended and it wasn't the best, I, excuse me, I wasn't the best boyfriend or step parent by any means, but I tried the best I could. The person was literally the best thing I knew. I just couldn't uh, figure out how to tell them in their language that they were. Fast forward a couple months later, we now live separately and rarely talk. I've done everything to get them back, including quitting that dip in my lip and gotten so close to God. I go to church a lot, found a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ, made amends with my family and proved to myself that I don't have to live that party mentality. I want to prove to her so badly that the old me is out, but she doesn't seem to believe me because in the past I didn't change. What are some of the ways to understand if this is God's will to let them go or if he wants me to keep fighting for my family? Talking about God. I, I'm honestly scared of this going on the podcast because of them hearing and I'm scared of lo losing my faith and going back to my old sinful ways. Please help me get over this. Help me, please. Okay, um, interesting. I wonder if, and if the 
person is actually hearing uh, this on the podcast. Wouldn't that be something? Okay, so let's get into this anonymous. Where to start? I'm seeing four paragraphs here. Um, by the way, if you want to e- if you want to email me, podcast at grangersmith.com, I'll answer this. Uh, any any question you have, I'll put it into the queue, just like I'm doing right now. Um, first of all, I want to say this sounds just like a country song. You see this kind of stuff happen all the time. Um, many country songs are written <laughs> situations just like this. You had someone, you you lost the someone, and you wish you had them back. You wish you could just have said the things that that person needed to hear, and then everything would have been right. You know, there's that old song uh, by Steve Warner says, it's not what I did, it's what I didn't do. And that sounds like a 90s country song wrapped around your situation. So first of all, I say that in, in a way to just say, hey, you're not alone. This is a good old-fashioned heartbreak. Um, but there are some things that worry me in, in it itself. And I don't know... I don't know how old you are. It, it's it's always concerning when there's when there is um, kids involved, and there's there's kids involved in this scenario because you're you're talking about I wasn't the best boyfriend, I wasn't the best stepdad, and then so I, I'll probably start there. Out of everything, I'll probably start there and go, oh man, I, it's so tough when you're you're not only making a mistake to the 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 girlfriend, but you're also making a mistake to the girlfriend's kid. And it's just, it, it puts a whole new wrinkle on it. It makes it that much more difficult. And I say to everyone else that's listening, you gotta, you gotta be so careful when, when she has a child. And I'll say this to the single mother as well. You can't get serious like this in in a way that you can get hurt in front of the child because it's confusing for the kid the kids going the kids now going through the breakup as well right i guess you could say the same thing especially that one line that says i wasn't uh, the best stepdad um I, I think i would probably say too i would i don't even like that word stepdad if you weren't you weren't a stepdad to begin with, um, how you said step parent. I wasn't the best boyfriend or step parent by any means, but but you weren't a, you weren't a parent. You weren't a step parent. You you were just dating the mom carelessly. Okay, um, and so we're going to put that aside. We're going to put that part of it on the shelf. That's the first paragraph. Um, the second paragraph, you you live separately, and you know what that implies, right? You say, fast forward a couple months later, now we live separately and rarely talk. The implication of that is that you, were, you guys were living together. You were dating her, and she had a kid with another man, and you moved in with her. And then you screwed it up, and she's gone. And it's one thing for the mom, for the girl. It's, it's bad for her. But, but think of what you're doing for the kid. What what message is it sending for the kid? You say, I go to church a lot, and I found a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ, lowercase c. I made amends with my family and proved to myself that I don't want to live that party mentality. I want to prove to her so badly that the old me is out, but she doesn't seem to believe me. And I don't either. <laughs> Because first of all, here's the, here's the reasons. And brother, by the way, this is tough love. I'm, this is not a knock on you. I'm doing my best here to give you the information that I think you need. And, and first of all, only a couple months you say have gone by. If you say it's been seven years, I'm a new man. Now I'm believing you. You say a couple months have gone by and I've changed my ways, Granger. I don't believe you. And that's okay. Time will build trust. So consistency and time will build trust. Um, You go to church a lot and being around brothers and sisters in Christ, that's a good step. But that doesn't mean you're healed. That just means something you're doing. 
um, you, where does it, where did you say you, you gave up, you gave up some bad habits and you've gotten so close to God. Okay. Well, first, God, first of all, God didn't want you living with it, that woman. That's what you would call a sexual sin, which is really bad in the Bible. Not that, not that Christianity is work-based, but meaning, let me, let me explain that. You don't do anything to earn your relationship with God. You don't give up dip and you don't, you don't move out from your girlfriend's house and quit sexual sin to get close to God. It doesn't work. God goes, oh, you've already messed it up. You're already guilty. That's like saying to the judge, imagine you get convicted of murder and you go to the trial and they're trying you for murder. And the, the, the jury comes in with their verdict and it is guilty. All evidence you're guilty, you're caught on video, There's, it's, it's just obvious they have the murder weapon, and the judge says, you're convicted guilty, what do you have to say? And you say, judge, that was a couple months ago, I've been going to church, and I've, been, I've quit some things, and I don't do that murder stuff anymore. The judge goes, thanks for the story, you're still guilty, right? So that's what God says. When you say, but God, I've gotten a lot better. He goes, you're guilty. In fact, you've always been guilty. And same with me and same with everyone listening. Uh, we were born with this sin. It's, we, we, we've inherited sin as humans. And it, it is so bad. It, it has infested us so bad that we have broken the law of God. And the, the worst sin we could do, the, the worst implication of sin that we could do is break the commandments of God. And we've all done that. And the verdict is guilty. So he says, you can't earn your way back. It's already done. There is nothing you could do. In fact, the Bible says that all your good works, all your good deeds are like garbage to me. It's like dung to me. It means nothing. And so, knowing this, God sent forth his son, Jesus. 100% God, 100% man to earth to live the life that you couldn't, the perfect life, that didn't live with the girlfriend who had a kid, that didn't do all the bad habits that you did, didn't have the party life that you had. Instead, Jesus fulfilled all God's commands perfectly and then was taken to the cross and murdered, becoming, but it was planned, purposed, so that he could become the final sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice that took on that death, that punishment of your guilty verdict, he was made guilty. He who was innocent was made guilty for the sake of the guilty to be innocent. You. You see what I mean? So Jesus became guilty for you. He was the only innocent man that became guilty for you so that you, a guilty man, could be made innocent if you trust in him. So those with trust in Jesus are set free. They're released from the, 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 the penalty that you've been accused of. That's the gospel. But let me go back full circle to what I was saying. I will know, and anyone will know, that that gospel truth has taken root in your heart because you will no longer want to be part of anything that remotely smells or looks like sin. That's not to say that you won't, but you will hate it. And you'll do everything you, you will scratch and claw to get away from it because it's, it's an infestation of sin. And, and that's the, the sign of a believer is not that he's sinless, it's that he is doing everything he can to eradicate the sin itself. So he's doing everything he can to get away from it. And, and two months go by, and you've moved out from your girlfriend's house, and you've quit putting dip in your lip, and you've, you, you're not partying as much. That's not enough of a track record for me to go, oh yeah, that gospel is taking root in, in, in your heart. You see what I mean? Um, and then lastly, your last, your last question here, what are some ways to understand that if that is it God's will for me to let this girl go, or if he wants me to keep fighting for my family, it's not your family. Don't say it that way. You're not a step parent and it's not your family. This is a girlfriend until it's time to get things together and put a ring on her finger. It's a girlfriend. And so that you've messed up by the way. And so you say, I'm honestly scared. I don't know. I'm scared of going back into my old sinful ways over this. That sums it up right there. 
if you see Jesus for the value that he is, the, the sacrifice that he made to free you from hell, when you see that, when you see that you deserve hell and you have a ticket punched for it, same as me, and you realize what Jesus did to free you from that, if you realize that, then you're saved and you don't want to go back into those old ways again. Once again, it's not, it's not like you, you're free and clear of it, but you don't want to. You don't sit around and go, I'm so worried I'm going to get back into my old sinful ways. You go, I'm not going back there. I've seen the truth. I've seen the treasure. I don't want any part of it. So what do you do? You go back to hearing the truth again. Now, hopefully that's preached in a good church. If you're in College Station, which I think you are, uh, I would go to Mosaic Church. My buddy Sam Kreitz is the pastor there, and that is a good gospel teaching church. Mosaic Church, Sam Kreitz. He's a good friend of mine. Tell him I sent you. Um, and, and let's deal with this last question here. How do you know God's will? How do you know if it's God's will for you to get back with this girl or not? Romans 12, 2 is always a good, good go-to. It says, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you can discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, don't be transformed. Don't look like this world. Don't, don't conform to this world. Instead, be renewed by, your, by, by the Word, by, by being around other believers that, that keep you accountable, that say, hey man, don't go back into that sin. Hey man, here, let me say the gospel to you again like Granger did on the podcast. Let me show you the treasure so you can show, so you, can show you what you've been saved from if you are that person that has faith in Christ. And then all of those things, when you realize that the, your main issue right now is that, is that you have a one-way ticket punched to hell, if you realize that that's your main problem right now, you're not going to worry as much about the girlfriend but the crazy thing is, as you start considering what Jesus did for sinners to redeem them to God, to make things right in that courtroom, remember? To make things right after you got declared guilty by the jury, Jesus comes and says, I'll take the fine. Put it on me. Put it on my body. I pay the penalty for him. He's mine. That one's my child. I redeem him. I restore him. I adopt him as a son. He's an heir, a co-heir to the kingdom. He gets everything the Father has given to me. By my divine right, I give it to him by implication of what I did on the cross. That one's mine. Don't touch him. When you realize that's you, when you realize you are that child, everything changes. Everything comes off of that. Everything as far as the way you treat this girl the way, the, the way you interact with your friends, the way you want to want or not want to party anymore with them, the way you treat this stepkid, the way you treat your boss and your, your employees and your coworkers and your mom and your dad, the way you value church and your brothers and sisters there, the way you value your own finances, the way you value your free time. Everything changes when you realize you're that guy that Jesus says, that's mine. Don't touch him. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I know them. I give them eternal life and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That one's mine. No one snatches him out of my hand. When you realize that's you, everything changes. So to you, anonymous, I'm saying, is that you? Are you realizing that? Are you still like, yeah, I'm trying to get close to lowercase g God. I'm trying to get understand my brothers in lowercase c Christ. And I, but I, what I really want, Granger, is I really want to get all my stuff and bring my truck back in the driveway and move back in with that girl who I really like. And I, I want to make things good again. And I kind of want to party too. I think I've been really clear on this answer. Next question comes from Bryn. Bryn says, hey, Granger, I've been going to the same church my whole life, and I've recently been baptized as a teenager, and I'm not exactly sure on what my church thinks about women preaching the gospel. I'm not referring to leading the church. Instead, I'd like to know if I could speak at my school's FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and would that be okay and not against uh, what the Lord says about women preaching the gospel? 
uh, I just, I could just share my testimony and I feel like others would, would get more out of this if I gave them a little bit of a short speech, I guess you could call it, she says. Um, it would just be a short sermon and I would talk about my relationship with the Lord. I've attended FCA meetings where women either give testimonies or short sermons. I think it's okay for women to share the gospel just as long as they're not leading a church as a preacher would. And uh, I have asked my youth leader about it, and he really couldn't give me an answer. I just need help on this, and I hope your answer could be helpful to me in some way. I hope you're able to help me. Thank you, and God bless. Okay, Brent, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with you sharing your testimony and sharing the gospel. Uh, in fact, it would be weird if you didn't. It's, as, um, as Christians, all of us, men, women, we're called to be ministers in our lives, and, and we are ambassadors for, for Christ. And God makes his appeal through us. Isn't that crazy? So, yeah, share your testimony. Share, share the gospel. Um, this is not talking about the qualifications for elders, like a Titus 1 qualification for elder or shepherd or pastor or church leader. Uh, this is not talking about anything that, um, that, I, that I think you're trying to confuse you giving a Sunday morning sermon with sharing the gospel and your testimony at an FCA meeting. Uh, absolutely nothing wrong, and absolutely uh, there's no discrepancy there. Next question comes from Jared. It says, hey, Granger, my name's Jared. I'm 20 years old. I'm pursuing a... Um, sorry, I'll keep putting on these glasses because it's just so much easier to see. Um, I'm 20 years old and I'm pursuing a career in, in electrical construction. I'm a Christian man pursuing a relationship. For a good couple of years now, I couldn't help but notice that my church here in small town Cottonwood, Arizona is dying. My church is fairly large and has around 600 seats. Uh, but only about 50 people attend. The congregation consists of mainly older folk around 60 years and up, and there's no young people. I've got a good group of buddies that I've grown up with that attend here, and that's about it for young people. It's hard because this church, this is my home church, and I grew up here, but I also want to branch out and meet new people. It's sad to see my home church I, that I believe is dying. Any ideas for tackling a dying church? I was thinking about your second sentence, I'm a single Christian man pursuing a relationship. Uh, that kind of threw me off a little bit because it has nothing to, it has nothing to do with that. I think that was just background information. Okay, yeah, so so Jared, I appreciate the question. And yes, you're right, it is sad to see a church dying. Um, and we see, we see many churches dying, especially in towns like this. And there are many symptoms of a dying church. I think I think I could say here. I should probably insert that um, the Lord will keep His church. The Lord will sustain His church, capital C. Um, it doesn't always have to mean that uh, a certain church is, needs to be meeting in a certain location, and a door could be closing. A door could be opening towards a merger. Maybe there's another church that's doing that's doing well, and they want to merge with your fifty people. And they're 300 people. And then you got a new church of 350. Um, you merge leadership. If, if you guys have cl really close on doctrine and you agree on leadership, um, a church merger is, is a good thing. I don't think you're into that. I don't think you're interested in that. I think you're, you're more about leaving <laughs> because um, it's, it seems to me that you're saying, I want to branch out and meet new people. Um, so certainly... It's, you know, a merger could be cool, but uh, but it sounds like you're you're wanting to just move on. Um, the the thing to prepare yourself against the best way to pre prepare your church against uh, dying is having a, a a good leader or leaders that preach the gospel that that teach expositionally through the Bible where the point of the message is the point of the sermon. The point of the passage or the, the Bible verse that the pastor's reading is the point of the message and not the other way around. If you want, you want more messages that come expositionally, meaning 
the point of the message is the point of the sermon. Unless there's a topic and this is a really cool uh, lesson on finances or love or relationships or heartbreak or loss or careers or friendships, and we're going to use the Bible to support the topic at hand. It's a man-centered gospel. It's a man-centered teaching, and it typically fails. Um, whether sooner or later, uh, that's a good way to kill a church. Um, a, a good way to sustain a church and to fuel it. And it, think of it as an engine, and the church, the engine, loses fuel without the gospel. The gospel is going to fuel the church, and and more people will be sustained by it. Uh, man-centered, man-centered teaching, man-centered preaching, uh, eventually is going to drive out everyone uh, because they're going to be they're going to be left hungry and they're going to be starving and they're going to need real food and not fast food that they're getting or salad. They're going to want steak and potatoes and they're only going to get steak and potatoes with a church that che- that teaches expositionally. I don't even say if you notice on this podcast of the last several years, I don't even say things like a church that preaches that teaches from the Bible. I don't use that anymore. Because that seems to be what everyone says. My thank goodness my church teaches from the Bible. Well, it'd be weird if it wouldn't even be a Christian church at all if you didn't teach from the Bible. So let's let's say there's a new level. Of course you teach from the Bible, but I'm talking about teaching from a passage. And the passage is the point, the whole point. Like, welcome, open your Bibles. Today we're we're gonna be in First Corinthians. And I want you to turn to, to this page or this chapter, and we're going to read these 11 verses. And then we're going to talk about the point of those 11 verses. And then we're going to talk about how this applies to our lives today. What can we learn from Paul in this message that he was speaking to the Corinthians that we could apply to our lives today? Here, well, here's some applications for us. In light of what Paul was saying. Instead of saying, hey, we've got these problems, let's go thumb through the Bible and see if we could find some solutions to it. You see what I mean? I, I don't. I can go a thousand directions on, on answering how to, what to do with your dying church, and it's tragic either way. But um, having a pastor that is bold, and courageous, and loves the word, and loves people, and loves the sheep, and 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 has given his life to to faithfully preaching a, a solid gospel that uses the Bible and, and teaches expositionally out of it, you're in good shape if you have that. Even if you have 50 people, there's nothing wrong with 50 people, essentially. I've been in churches around the world that, are, that meet under a tree, and there's seven people, and it's a healthy church. It's not based on, it's never been based on numbers, and so uh, you have a bunch of empty seats. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad church. I think the, the sign that is dying is there's less and less every week. I think that's what you're saying. And there's no young people. That's a good sign too. So I hope that answers. And I don't think that, I don't think any of that's your question. I think truly your question is, Granger, I think I'm leaving. Where should I go? And so I say, okay, it's not necessarily your job to save the church you grew up in. That's not your job. You are a, you're a, um, pursuing a career in electrical construction. Okay, that's not that's not you to save the church. But what you can do being 20 is plant yourself in a church that's teaching expositionally with a pastor who loves people and loves Jesus and cannot wait every Sunday to give you the message that you need to hear from the Bible. Right? Uh, that that's what that's where I would go with this. I think that's what you want to do and you'll know a healthy church when you see it. Let me say one more thing. There's a, there's a great book. It's a nine marks book. It's called, What is a Healthy Church? Everyone write that down. What is a Healthy Church? It's a very short book. If you're not a reader, g- grab it on, on Audible or some kind of audio book format. What is a Healthy Church? What is a Healthy Church? Read it. Super short, super simple. Um, a dear, dear brother of mine wrote that book. And um, it's, I think it would give you, it would expound on all the ideas I said, plus some. Okay. 
I love you guys. See you next Monday. Thanks for joining me on the Granger Smith Podcast. I appreciate all of you guys. You could help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to this channel. Hit that little like button and the notifications bell so that you never miss any time I upload a video. Yee-hee. <laughs>